everybody back again for our, our next uh, session of the bi-weekly webinars hosted by North Texas Soccer. And, and we're continuing on with the series that we had on trying to find supplemental ideas and supplemental uh, information for our coaching courses to where we can help those that are going through the process find new and, and interesting ways to, to gather information to, to really take the coaching part to the, the next level. And when I was thinking about developing these things and putting it together, there's one guy that came to mind, you know, Sam Snow, who I've been blessed to be able to work with quite a bit in the coaching education realm. And every time I sit down in one of his sessions or, or work with them, I find myself learning quite a bit. And so when it came out to the time to start doing this thing, I reached out and, and luckily we we're blessed enough to have you. And thank you, Sam, for joining us today. I sure appreciate you taking the time to, to help us out at North Texas. Thank you, Warren. And thank you for the opportunity to, to do this and to, uh, absolutely touch on, as you and I have talked, uh, a lot of the extra parts that coaches, you know, could learn and, and use in developing their teams that uh, adds to uh, the whole fun uh, and, and uh, growth within the youth soccer experience. So let me go ahead and get started, uh, everyone, with what Warren and I had discussed as a good topic for this webinar, which is the principles of attack. And as you can see in the subtitle, a little bit about the attacking roles uh, that players have. So here's what we'll cover today. We'll first dive into, actually, I'll first dive into what the, the game is, but then the principles of play, uh, the players' roles, those three roles that I just touched on, uh, more specifics on and details on each of the principles of attack, and then how the three roles in attack, because there's only three, there's only six roles, everybody, in the game. There's three roles in attacking, three roles in defending. We'll, we'll get into that a little bit on the attacking side of the coin. And then we'll, we'll see how that connects to the team tactical principles, which is what you find in uh, the U.S. Soccer's uh, grassroots uh, roadmap document, uh, the player development framework, some of those other uh, materials from the Federation. So for you first are these principles are uh, of the game. What is the sport? Soccer is an invasion game. And all invasion games, whether it's soccer, basketball, ice hockey, lacrosse, uh, they all have the same fundamental principles. The rules are slightly different. Uh, the tactics are predominantly the same. The techniques are different. Uh, but actually, a lot of the strategies and tactics are the same because they have the same foundation of being in an invasion sport, which is basically uh, we invade your end of the field, you know, invade, so to speak, uh, by in getting into your end of the field. And your team tries to stop. take of space. On the attack, we take space, we try to create space, we try to make the game wider and, and longer. Uh, when we're defending, we try to make it smaller. So it's all this give and take of space. So this means that all invasion games are playing under these same basic principles of play. Uh, there's a table with both the principles of attack and principles of defense. Uh, we're going to focus on the principles of attack that you can see on the left of the table, uh, but there's all of that information for you. We'll come back to this as a reminder at the end, uh, but we will go through each of the principles of attack, everyone, uh, with a little bit more detail. But as you take a look, please, just for a moment at the table and you look at the left column on principles of attack, you see the principle, but then you see some added information, either in parentheses after a dash and then some parentheses uh, where it flushes it out a little bit. What does one of those principles begin to actually mean in the way that players are expected to try to apply them in a match? And that means then how we as coaches need to be able to try to teach it to the players so that they can begin to understand these principles. So here's a big thing, please, everyone, about the principles of play, whether it's attacking or defending. If you basically teach your players the principles to where they can begin to comprehend the principles of the game, 
begin to actually then apply them via tactics, via team formations, via their ball skills. Now they're beginning to be able to think for themselves and apply these principles to many, many different game situations. So I talked to coaches about it's more important in the end to begin to teach the players the principles of the game. And from that understanding, they can begin to uh, apply it, as I said, to a lot of different game situations. So looking at this table, and as I mentioned, there are six rules within every soccer team on the planet at every level of play. Uh, all the changes is the number of players on the field. So we go from four versus four up to 11 versus 11 in our player development scheme in the USA. Uh, but then within that head count of players, there are different formations so that you can organize your players out on the field and, and whatever formation makes it the best for them to be able to perform. But within, no matter what the head count is, no matter what the game model is, no matter what uh, the team formation is, there are these six roles. We're going to focus on uh, the first uh, few rows that you see here on the table, which are attack. So everything above the red line which is the first attacker, second attacker, third attacker. And we'll hit again on uh, how those rules apply a number of different principles. But you can see the primary principles of attack that those three attacking roles are expected to execute and a little bit of information as to how they can actually execute it. Uh, but there's a lot more depth to that as we go along. So here are the, the principles of attack again, just worded for you a little bit differently to help uh, with coaches comprehending the principles of attack and for coaches to be able to share the knowledge, share the information with their players. Uh, uh, but as you can see in each one of these things, just look at penetration. Well, it could be via shooting to try to score goals. It could be via a pass and you get the assist off of the teammate who scores a goal. Uh, it could be making forward progress. Uh, so this is where we make the, the decision as the player with the ball, do I penetrate? Do I do that via a dribble, via a pass, via a shot? Those are the ways to penetrate. Uh, keep possession in any direction with playing possession of the ball so that we can have the chance to penetrate. We look at support. Now we're getting into the second role of the second attacker, and that's providing assistance and option for the person with the ball to be able to combine with that teammate. Uh, you look at width, that's going to happen mostly from the third attackers who are on the off the ball side, the far side away from the ball, uh, trying to get in behind the opposing defense. And then you look at depth, which is uh, how do we stretch out the other team lengthwise on the field, north to south. Width is east to west, depth is north to south. How do we create space? How do we create openings? in both width and depth, north and south and east and west on the field. So here are the three roles for the attack. <clears throat> and the first attacker is the player, as, it's, as it says, possession of the ball, having to make the decision about when do I penetrate, when do I play possession. It, and one of the things that I know all of you see, particularly in our younger players, is their excitement and their uh, uh, over enthusiasm <laughs> to go forward. And so we penetrate often when it's not tactically the right place or the right time uh, to go forward with the ball, to penetrate with the ball, because we're maybe in a numbers down situation, one against two, one against three, one against four. We've seen that in youth soccer and we end up losing the ball. And you'll see some youth soccer games where both teams play that way, where they force the penetration. They force the ball and the attack going forward and end up losing the ball. And both teams do it. And it becomes a game of kickball back and forth rather than a game of, of soccer. So a big part emotionally, psychologically, tactically, is young players gradually learning when to keep it in order to create quality chances to go forward. And then what are the cues in the game to know that I can actually go forward either on my own in combination with teammate or a couple of teammates and this is where now we begin to get into the role of the second attacker which there can be more than one uh, the support player on the attack 
often is behind the player with the ball, but could be square to that player or in front of that player. So the player with the ball could have options, passing options, to combine with a teammate behind him or her, square to that player or in front of that player. Uh, so big part of what the second attacker attackers need to make decisions on or when does the person with the ball need more than one support option? And then when I am in a support position, am I at the right distance? Am I at the right angle? We'll hit on that a little bit more too. And then on the off the ball side uh, are the third attackers. And uh, they are the ones who, uh, when we look at a big switch of the point of attack, Switching the point of attack is not just the big, long diagonal ball from you know, one channel of the field to a far opposite channel of the field. Switching the point of attack could be a five-yard pass or a 45-yard pass. Uh, switching the point of attack often sometimes goes to uh, the second attacker, a second attacker, but could go on the far side to one or more third attackers. Uh, so just like the second attacker, there could be just one third attacker, but there could be more than one, uh, providing different runs and different options for the player with the ball. So for the first attacker, these are his or her technique options as to how he or she, in this example, will penetrate, make forward progress. Uh, it could be shooting off of a header, off of the foot. It could be with a penetrating pass. It could be with a penetrating dribble. And what we as the coaches need to do is to help the players recognize the game cues when to do one of those three penetrating techniques. Um, so a lot of that has to do with where am I on the field? Well, scoring off of a header, scoring off of a shot with my foot, uh, that's not realistic until I'm in the attacking third. So when we're looking at the midfield third and the defending third, uh, the player with the ball, who's the first attacker, makes the decision, how are we going to advance the ball and make forward progress? Is it the right moment to dribble the ball? Is it the right moment to pass the ball? Do I dribble a little bit in order to create the angle and the option, the opening for a pass? These are a lot of the decisions to be made. I get into the attacking third and I have the ball. I like players to the first thing you think about and ask yourself when you're in that part of the field and you get the ball is, do I have the chance for a shot? If yes, hit it. Let's pull the trigger. Let's take chances. It comes back to the old Wayne Gretzky uh, uh, quote of, you miss 100% of the shots that you don't take. Uh, you're in shooting range. Let's start taking some chances. Uh, sometimes there might be a teammate who's in a, a better position for a higher percentage shot. Uh, and now that's another decision, tactical decision to be made, you know, by the players. Uh, so now I'm passing the ball to a teammate who's in a better position. So there's a lot of different game cues in the attacking third, all of which need to happen in a blink of an eye uh, as to do I shoot? Do I pass the ball? Do I dribble some more? Uh, and making those decisions and reading the game cues is part of what we as the coaches need to help the players uh, to recognize. So whoever has the ball, doesn't matter what position they play on the team, whoever has the ball is the first attacker. And they're making this decision, which seems simple in the one sentence that you see here <laughs> of decide between penetration or possession. Uh, but tactically, and then the techniques to do one or the other uh, are actually harder uh, and, and get to be greater in number as the players get older and they get into higher levels of uh, soccer. Uh, so because the environment then tactically becomes more complex. So making those decisions between when to penetrate and when to possess, uh, and you see uh, individual players and sometimes entire teams uh, overdo one or the other. Uh, the one that's the most common, everybody, we all know, are the youth soccer teams that, that force the forward play, force the penetration, uh, as I mentioned earlier. But we do see 
less often, but it happens out there, of the team that, that they're really good at keeping possession of the ball, but they're not so good at being a threat to the other team because they keep possession so much. They end up playing so much east-west or backwards uh, that they don't eventually or they miss opportunities to penetrate, <clears throat> to go forward uh, and be a threat to the other team and, and create goal-scoring chances for themselves. So in the end, everyone, it's this balance between the first attacker's decision on possession or penetration. And um, I have found that even kids as young as nine or 10 can begin to make these decisions when they are coached correctly and when the coach talks to the parents of those players and gets them to understand what the coach is doing with them. Uh, and I'm mentioning this because you get from the crowd a whole lot, from the spectators a whole lot of youth games about go forward, go forward, go forward. Uh, but I found nine and 10 year olds, if the environment is correct, they can begin to begin to recognize <clears throat> when to play square backwards in order to keep the ball for a moment to create the chance to go forward. But they play the ball backwards to draw opponents pl opposing players towards the ball, which opens up a space for them to be able to play the ball into for somebody to run into. Uh, so you can get nine and 10 year olds to begin uh, at that at that stage of making those kinds of decisions. So now this is the, the first attacker making his or her decision about possession uh, and keeping possession in any direction. And the little diagrams that I made are, are just examples. You know, it's a square pass, a, a backwards pass at any angle. Um, it's dribbling square, dribbling backwards at any angle. And we do this in order to keep possession of the ball to create opportunities to penetrate somewhere else. Uh, then we do this because the, uh, the opposing team has blocked the path uh, and we're trying to uh, not give the ball away and, and not get into this kickball routine that I mentioned earlier uh, and keep the ball. That means sometimes we have to play square backwards in order to be able to go forward. So this is a whole lot for coaches to teach to young players, uh, be they 10 years old, 15 years old. From my days as a college coach, I found I still needed to work on it with 20-year-olds in college teams about when to, when to keep it, how to keep it, when to go forward, and making those decisions. So in the principles of attack, one of them is improvisation, uh, creativity is what it's frequently called nowadays, but years ago we called it improvisation. Uh, and these are just two examples, uh, one from two great Argentine players. Uh, and um, all of you, I know all of you remember, the, even if you weren't uh, watching the game live, like Warren and I were uh, in 1986, uh, you've seen the recordings of it, you know, when Maradona went against England and, um, before his more infamous goal, or was it after his infamous goal? But this was the goal to remember. This was the real one to remember. When he gets the ball 12 yards on his side of the field and then goes from his end to the other end of the field and, and scores uh, past numerous uh, English defenders. Uh, that, all of that was improvisation. You know, he made his decision each time because he's been interviewed and Messi was interviewed and, and learned from Maradona because Messi then replicated it not only in a, a professional match with the example that you see on the left, but then later in a World Cup himself. Uh, but it was it was improvisation in that had the general idea, or at least Messi had the general idea somewhere in the back of his brain from having watched Marindona when he was a kid. Uh, but Marindona made it up as he went along based on the reaction of the opposing players. And what he said in the interviews was a lot of it had to do with the off-the-ball runs of his teammates made realistic and, and, and uh, authentic uh, options that he could have passed to one of them, and they would have been in an attacking threat. And the English defense knew it, so they had to pay attention to those off-the-ball runners, uh, those second attackers and third attackers. And each time that they shifted a little bit anticipating the pass, the English defense, that's when he recognized the chance to go forward on his own a little bit more. But he was always looking for that option if he needed it to apply to one of his off-the-ball teammates. Um, so this is, this is improvisation. 
And then here's a little bit more of improvisation, uh, a couple of examples from professional matches. Uh, the one that you see on the left is finishing with the header. That's one of our principles of attack is finishing. Uh, it could be off of a header, it could be off of the foot, could be I've seen goals scored off of kneecaps and you know, et cetera, right? Uh, and then another one is improvisation finishing with a redirection. And the example of the graphic that you see on the screen on the right is a player outstretching himself to bounce the ball, redirect the ball, deflect the ball, in this instance, off the sole of his foot. Uh, but you see players redirect the ball uh, off, of, off of flick headers, uh, off of uh, different parts of the foot. So often that finishing could be a redirection of the ball as opposed to uh, a shot of their own or a header of their own. Uh, it's just that little flip. So these are a couple more examples of finishing and improvisation uh, in the scoring range. Uh, in this instance, both instances, as it happens, it's at the top of the goal area, uh, but it could happen a little bit further out um, depending upon the situation. So as I mentioned, any player who has the ball is the first attacker. So goalkeepers are attackers. Fullbacks are attackers. When they have the ball, they're an attacker. When their team has the ball, they are an attacker. Uh, so I think we coaches need to spend a little bit more time in training, not only helping our goalkeepers on their techniques of distribution, bowling the ball, throwing the ball, sidearm throws, overarm throws, goal kicks, drop kicks, sidewinders, punts, uh, to improve their accuracy. It's a pass. Uh, a goalkeeper distribution is a pass, no different than a field player making a pass, and that is accuracy is a really important part of good passing. Uh, and then helping goalkeepers recognizing the tactics as to when to distribute short, when to distribute middle distance, uh, when to distribute long uh, down the field. So uh, the goalkeeper is a first attacker uh, when he or she has possession of the ball or at a goal kick when he or she's taking the goal kick. And then sometimes you'll see some goalkeepers that have the, the abilities to read the game and they have the athletic ability to play outside of their penalty area or near the top of their penalty area that on a big through ball by the opposition, they are in a good spot to be able to come out and, and clear that through ball from the opposition, uh, collect the back pass from a teammate, you know, and then play it out the other side. Uh, but the point is that the goalkeeper is often the first attacker and is frequently um, a second attacker when your team is building the ball up out of the back third that the ball has gone out to one of the backs, they try to go up, just for example, they try to go up the right flank, they get shut down, they play the ball back to a center back or to their goalkeeper who's in a position to support, and that person then plays out the other side. Uh, so your goalkeeper uh, will probably never, we hope, play the role of third attacker, <laughs> uh, but the goalkeeper could be the first attacker, second attacker in many different game situations. And then and just as a reminder, uh, the person taking the corner kick is the first attacker and probably the most important player in a corner kick play because if the ball is not served well, accurately with the right timing, the right height, the right pace, et cetera, then any good attacking set play for a corner kick is not going to work because the ball is not delivered correctly. Uh, so the first attacker taking the corner kick is a really important player. And then um, again, the person taking the throw in is often overlooked as being a first attacker. And what kind of choices does that player make, tactical choices, about where to throw the ball, how to throw the ball? We don't take enough time to teach throw-in techniques to players about how to throw soft for a short throw-in, how to throw hard for a longer throw-in, uh, and then the tactical decisions. We see way too many youth games where the throw-in is always forward, always down the touchline, and therefore becomes quite predictable. Uh, 
Uh, and I don't think enough coaches are working with their teams on the tactics of throw-ins. And now this first attacker who's taking the throw-in, his or her choice about when to throw the ball in backwards so that we can go out the other side, when to throw it basically square, when to throw it forward, uh, that there's more options than just throwing the ball forward down the line. And then three kicks. Obviously, the player on the ball, whether it's a direct or an indirect free kick, uh, the player on the ball is the first attacker. It's an indirect free kick, uh, and that player is going to touch it to a teammate to, to get a shot off. The quality of that touch, the decision that that person makes is very important uh, to the opportunity uh, that the previously second attacker is not going to have as the first attacker. Uh, but if it's a direct free kick, you know, then making the decision about am I within shooting range? Do I have a good shooting angle? If yes, then maybe I take a chance directly at goal. If I'm too far away for a shot on goal, if my angle is too uh, flat for a shot on goal, then what other choices am I making to create opportunities you know, for my team? Do I treat it basically like a corner kick? And, and try to get the ball in? Do I treat it like uh, a build-up pass uh, to be now we get our attack going? Uh, so tactical choices and technique choices uh, for the first attacker on the ball at a free kick. And then finally, taking a look at uh, some of the tactics, but certainly the technique of a penalty kick. Clearly the person taking the kick is the first attacker. Uh, so a big part is, is that person's tech. Uh, for shooting at a core kick, then some of the tactics that if they're going to shoot, uh, making decisions about where to shoot on goal. Uh, obviously, we've seen a, a lot of options there, you know, done by players to the sides low, to the sides high. Some will hesitate just a moment and then shoot right down the middle, thinking open, often the goalkeeper diving, and now the middle is open. Uh, and then you see the, the last choice for this person taking the penalty kick is one that you see rarely, but it happens, of uh, the tap penalty, where I tap the ball as a pass, and now a teammate runs in to, to score on the ball, uh, to take advantage of the ball. And it's an attempt to get the goalkeeper to move once again, uh, and you do see it occur once in a while, mostly at the professional level or, or, at, or at the international level. Uh, it's pretty rare, even at those levels. Uh, most teams opt to just play it. Most players opt to just play it directly themselves for the shot. Uh, but I just wanted to bring up everybody that the first attacker on a penalty kick has this choice. This is another option. Uh, but when they choose to shoot directly themselves, I think we coaches need to Spend a little bit more time on the shooting technique, uh, whether it's an in-step drive, inside of the foot, uh, making decisions about what part of the goal to play to, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And with youth players, uh, the most of them, it's just keep it simple. Don't try to do stutter runs and you know all the things that you see sometimes happening with pros. Uh, for the youth players, my experience has been just keep it simple <laughs> and go in and, and strike the ball and, and have good accuracy. If you put a good ball in a low corner, very, very difficult for a goalkeeper to get to, particularly if the ball has pace on it, you know, in a way they go. But an interesting statistic down at the bottom of the photo uh, is that it's not a it's not a for sure thing of PK that your team is going to score on the PK or that the other team is going to score on the PK. So it's just another tactical part to be aware of it and ready for. So the role of the second attacker or attackers in immediate support to the player with the ball, the first attacker, as I mentioned earlier, they can uh, give support from behind, square to, or in front of the first attacker. The big, two big things that I see in youth soccer games in particular is the lack of mobility on the part of the second attacker. Uh, I see a lot of ball watching by the attackers. They watch their teammate who has the ball and wait for that player to do something before they then respond, react, rather than 
can I move into a position early to give my teammate who has the ball an option, to give them a passing option? Um, so I don't see, in general, enough movement, early movement, and tactical movement uh, on the part of second attackers to be in a position to support and to think then about, yes, I'm in a position to support, but is there a, a passing lane? Is there an open passing lane? So, for example, you see it on some passes in the flow of a game. You see it very much at a throw-in with kids in the 10 and under age group playing seven-side soccer. That they 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 are open, but there's not an there's not a passing lane that's open. There's one or more opposing players between them and the teammate with the ball. So the teammate with the ball is in a situation where they can't get the ball to the support player. So the support player needs to change one of two things or both. They need to change their angle of support or their distance of support. So the first thing, please, everybody, to get across to the kids, um, and this is a little bit less of an issue with the teenagers, but a lot of that depends on the soccer environment they grew up in, is when you recognize the, the moment that you need to be the support player on the attack, do you do it? Do you move and get into a good position to support? Are you making a good decision about do I support in this tactical situation in this part of the field from behind square to or in front of the teammate with the ball? I get into the attacking half of the field where I have the chance to be offside. I might have to double think about when do I support in, in advance of the ball. Uh, this depends on the tactical situation. Uh, but now once they've just made the decision to move and get into a position of support, now they have to think about their distance of support. Don't support so close that one opposing defender can end up shutting down both attackers. So getting that right distance of support and then getting the right angle of support so that there's a passing lane open between the support player, the second attacker, and the first attacker who has the ball. So, in fact, there's a lot of tactics, timing of runs, body angle, positioning to teach to the second attacker and to be able to read the game cues about where should I support, behind, square, or in front? How far away should I support? At what angle should I support? Do I have my body open that if the ball comes to me, I can now be a threat to go forward to uh, in making that decision? So here is uh, options uh, for the off the ball players in white. Um, one player marked up by the opposing player in red. That's the first attacker who has to make the choice about a pass forward square or backwards. And the, this is the second attacker. Getting into one of those positions uh, and then changing my distance, changing my angle, realistic to the situation. So. A big piece to get across to the second attacker in regards to the distance of support. How much pressure is there on the first attacker? If there's a lot of pressure on the first attacker, my support has to be much closer. Because the pass, when the first attacker is under heavy pressure, the pass is going to be short. Uh, and then I have to think about my angle. If the first attacker has a bit of space and time, there's less immediate pressure on that player, then the first attacker could get in a bigger swing of the kicking leg to be able to make a longer pass. That's the cue, game cue, for the second attacker to recognize I could support from further away because my teammate is in a position to be able to make a longer pass, longer distance. So the amount of pressure from the opposition is the predominant dictate as to whether I support from close or from far away. And so now it's the second attackers having to read that, that situation. So they have to look at the situation from what situation am I in to be able to provide support? And then what situation is the teammate with the ball in that he or she could get the ball to me? Uh, so then that is a decision of the amount of pressure on the first attacker. And then if you know your teammate well enough, does he or she have the ball skill 
to get the ball to me in different situations? What kind of passing techniques does my teammate have? And am I realistic to their passing technique? Or just not their technique, even their strength to get it to there. So we're playing, let's say, for example, we're playing nine-a-side soccer. So it's 11 and 12-year-olds. Well, I might be in a position to support 35, 40 yards away. But my teammate, who's 11, has good ball skills but doesn't have the strength yet to hit a 35, 40-yard ball. So I'm going to have to support from closer. So third attacker is the one who's on the weak side, the off-the-ball side furthest away from the ball, right? Uh, and that's the player who's looking to try to time his or her runs to getting behind opposing players, and especially if they can recognize when does that opposing player ball watch, that's my chance to go. So that's one of the game cues to teach to the third attackers. Take a look at the opposing players. If they're flat-footed, there's your chance to go. If they are turn their body so that they're ball watching, there's your chance to go because you can make your run behind that person and they won't know you're there. They won't even see you making the run. Uh, so there's a couple of game cues for the third attacker to make a decision about when to run and where to run to give a far option, a far side option. Then, of course, as the third attacker, I've got to recognize well, is the first attacker even in a situation to get me the ball? Yeah, I see space in front of me on the far side. I see the opportunity to go forward into that space. But my teammate on the ball, the first attacker, is playing one versus two. There's no way in a one versus two that he or she is going to be able to get their head up and hit a long-distance ball to the far side, to the far post side, if you will. Uh, so I've got to read what's happening with the first attacker, and then what's happening in front of me? What are my options? Is there space there? And then I've got to look at the body posture, the vision, the scanning or the lack of scanning by the opposing players to time my run, to know when do I take off on my run. Because the thing that you'll see as young players begin to learn about these off-the-ball runs on the far side of the field, they start most the biggest mistake at first is they go too soon. They go too early, and as a consequence, they end up standing still in the spot where they've ended up, or they run into an offside position and the ball is played to them and the offside call is made, or they end up in position but marked up because they got there too soon. Now they're basically standing, and, and an opponent figures out that they're there and comes over and marks them up. Uh, so the timing of the run is a big piece to begin to, to help uh, – uh, young players who are recognizing when and how to be the third attacker on the far side to help that person uh, recognize when and how to, to do that, to make that kind of a run. So here's the two basic runs uh, with two third attackers that you see in white. Uh, their teammate is on the far left uh, making the pass, uh, and they're one of the third attackers uh, made a decision to go to the opening between the two opposing center backs. Uh, another one has made a decision to make a bent outside run uh, behind the opposing defense. Uh, so all, all of this tactically is called unbalancing opposition. And you're trying to get, as you see the old saying, is getting on the blind side, getting where the defense has lost vision of you, um, which Honestly, it's not all that difficult to do at the youth level because, unfortunately, when we're defending, too many of our players ball watch. Uh, and so they're unaware of off-the-ball runs or they're too late being aware of the off-the-ball runs. Um, so this uh, is an option. So this is one example, the player in the yellow circle, uh, of making a diagonal off-the-ball run as a third attacker on the far side to, as I said, to split the opposing defenders. And then another one for the player in the yellow circle is this bent run to the outside. Um, so this one obviously is often, not always, but often over a longer yardage, longer distance to cover. So the timing has to be right. Uh, the person on the ball has to be a little bit more patient and able to keep the ball for a moment longer. 
uh, while that run is being made, uh, and then being able to time the pass so that um, that those off the ball runners can receive that pass, not in an offside position, hopefully to be able to receive the pass one or two strides in front of them so that they can run onto the ball. Uh, the, the challenge then in getting young players to begin to fully connect on this option of using the third attacker. Uh, besides the problem with the third attacker that I already mentioned about the timing of the run will be that the first attacker plays the ball incorrectly. So the ball ends up behind the third attacker. So they have to stop and go backwards for the ball or it's played too deep and the opposing goalkeeper or opposing field players are able to challenge for the ball before the third attacker is, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so this is the constant work that goes on even at a professional level of timing of passes, accuracy of passes, timing of runs, angle of runs, you know, et, et cetera, et cetera. But at the youth level, the biggest thing is the psychological, emotional part of the third attacker not running too soon, of holding your run, being patient for another one or two seconds to time your run and then to get in at speed to meet the ball at speed, not to meet the ball at half speed, not to meet the ball while you're standing still, but to be able to time your run and then time the pass where they connect with one another at speed. That's the most devastating to the opposing team and almost impossible for them to, to stop even if they see it coming, if it's all timed correctly. So for the second and third attackers, there are seven possible movements that he or she can do. Uh, I'm not going to go through in detail on each one. Um, this is being recorded, so you can watch it later and read it all the way through. I'll send a copy of the slide deck to Warren if you, if you want to post uh, up on the, on the State Association website uh, so that you can read through each of these seven runs in detail, uh, see what they are. Um, if you ever have any questions about what they are, how to execute them, how to coach them to players, get in touch with Warren and or myself, and we'll be glad to, to help you uh, more fully understand it and maybe even how do you incorporate it into some of your training session plans to be able to help teach it to your players. Um, so this is the first three of the seven possible attacking movements for the off the ball attackers. Here's the other four of those movements for the off the ball attackers. And so as you just begin to, to read this a little bit, digest it just a little bit, uh, you be, can begin to see everyone that for the off the ball attackers, there's a lot of tactics going on. And that in fact, everyone, I'll put forward this idea that when your team is on the attack, the most important players are the ones who don't have the ball. The person on the attacking team who has the ball, yes, that's an important player. But in fact, probably secondary of importance. Because if the off-the-ball players are not creating options for the on-the-ball teammate, then the on-the-ball teammate is stuck. They have little else to do but to shield for possession, to try to dribble for possession, and eventually lose the ball probably uh, because they end up probably getting outnumbered. Uh, they might start off in a 1v1, end up in a 1v2, 1v3 because the off-the-ball players, teammates, are not moving tactically, intelligently, timing their movements correctly, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, to be able to provide options for the teammate with the ball for the first attack. So all of this fits inside the principles of attack. And these are the team tactical principles, which is uh, a slightly different way of discussing, presenting the principles of play, in this case, the principles of attack in the slide that you see here. And you can see what the player actions are, the, the choices, uh, if you look at the top row, everyone, on the far left, uh, the column says TTP, which means Team Tactical Principles. Then you see underneath it ATT, which is attack, and then just go across first to the 4v4 game model, 77 game model, 99, 11v11, 
and you can see the, the growing list of things to coach, to teach to the players, and for the players to begin to understand and execute as the years go by, as they uh, move along uh, in the player development pathway and pyramid uh, from four side up to 11 side soccer. Uh, and it just gets to be more in depth and more in depth. So here's a little bit more for you in action with a couple of videos of the team tactical principles, which we'll see within it the principles of attack. Get some fresh legs in there. And the bad thing is the total number of caps for those six subs is probably less than 10. So just take a look at the column and table on the right as you watch the video and see how are they executing these principles. Get some fresh legs in there. And the bad thing is the total number of caps for those six subs is probably less than 10. But they can all play. This is a, a soccer playing country. Drop the ball. Being on the run. Looking at cross a nice ball for So you saw the video with a little bit of additional help of, of the subtitles going on in there. You look at the table on the right for attacking. Uh, you can see that underneath the attacking column, you go down and we're looking at how do we attack to the different thirds of the field. And the video was a great one in that it showed all three parts of the field. Uh, it showed from the goalkeeper distribution all the way to the other end of the field scoring a goal. And then you look at the middle column on the goal and you can see the, the actions for the players to make the principles that they are executing, et cetera, et cetera. So it is using this thought, this information, uh, take a look at the far left column, please, under attacking. And again, a big part of teaching the principles of attack to the players is helping them first to recognize where am I on the field? That as well as where my teammates and where the opposing players are factors that influence how am I going to execute in terms of technique and tactical positioning to be able to build the attack. Uh, so then you look at the goal, which is uh, the overall principle uh, in action as to what you're going to try to do in the three different thirds of the field. In the goal column, you look at the general principle, principles. And you can see how those are the principles of attack being done by those three roles of attackers, first attacker, second attacker, third attacker, how they're actually executing all of that. You look under the team tactical principles and you recognize that those are the principles of attack you know, along with some player actions. You look at the ones that are in gold, they're all important. They all apply in different situations on the field, in different thirds of the field, in different tactical situations. Uh, the ones in gold are the ones that you're going to see highlighted in the, in the next video and actually executed uh, by the United States versus Japan. So it'll be predominantly the principles in the gold box, and then number eight that you see down there in gold. And then you see that in order to be able to part of being able to apply the principles of the game and do the, the player actions requires these qualities from the players. The single most important one being number one. They're all important, but if our players do not scan, do not use their brains first and their legs second, then everything else begins to, to go off the rails eventually. Uh, so number one, of the key qualities is the single most important one to teach from age five years old on up. Uh, and just it's just going to get more sophisticated and faster as they get older. But we should be constantly re working at our players' abilities to scan, take, take in information, figure out what's going on around them to make decisions. So here it is in the game. Get some fresh legs in there. And the bad thing is the total number caps for those six subs is probably less than 10, but they can all play. This is a
So look at the principles on the right, and then look at the video. Uh, soccer. Playing country. Passing lines is the same as passing lanes. So there it is in, in action in this instance in, in one sequence. Uh, I don't know how often that happens, even for the national teams, uh, that it happens quite that so quickly, you know, inside of a minute uh, of gameplay, uh, especially in this instance when the USA was already 2 nailed down. Uh, but uh, there's a great example of those principles in action. So here, everybody, is a reminder here at the end of all of the principles of attack. Uh, and I think you uh, recognize now uh, that it's going to take many years to teach all of this thoroughly to the players to where it becomes second nature to them, where they think it instantly, they're recognizing what's going on in the game and begin to consistently execute uh, all of these principles of attack and that all the players understand it, understand their different roles at different times, the field players will all end up at different times uh, being either the first attacker, second attacker, or third attacker. It's more likely that flank players will end up being in third attacker roles than central players, but it's possible that central players on an overlap from the inside to the outside could end up in that third attacker role. Uh, but all of them will play, all of the field players will play first, second, and third attacker constantly throughout the game just depending upon the game situation. And then the goalkeeper will often play first attacker, second attacker. So questions for Warren or myself. And Warren, we have a few minutes for that. Okay. Yeah, and I'll go ahead and pull myself up mute, but hey, thank you very much for, for taking the time with this thing too. And I said, if you have questions, I know we got a good group here. You know, please feel free to unmute yourself or you can put it in the chat and I'll read it, but it's totally up to you how you want to do it. But gosh, what a great session. I really like the video at the end and, and the way you pulled it all together. That was awesome. And it looks like it's almost like math class sometimes, huh? <laughs> good morning. Good afternoon, Coach. Hi. Uh, this we miss sometimes in certification time. How can you guys um, help me implement what you just said on the field? Sorry, the, the audio is breaking up a little bit. Did you catch that, Warren? Yeah, Mar, can you can you repeat that? For some reason, I guess the connection might not be very good, but it's kind of chopping through. Okay, let me see. let me get the headphones again. And Warren, I think there's a few messages in the chat. I haven't looked, but I see that there it looks on my end like there's four messages was, in the chat. We had three or four, and it was based on how to get a copy of the the webinar. Oh, okay. webinar. Oh, okay. Mar, why don't you can you type that into the chat? There it is. Let me see if we've got it here. Oh. Oh, we got Adam in Oklahoma. Hi, Adam. Oh, thanks, Adam. I'm glad you joined us today. Mahar, if you'll take that and you'll type that in the chat, I can read it off the chat, and that way hopefully we can get you. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. 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 Yeah, that audio went a little from bad to worse there. <laughs> yeah. I think maybe it's got two things going at one time. Maybe a little echo. <laughs> Or wait on his to, to come in. Like I said, if anybody else has a has a question, it's a great time to come in. We've got a little more time here, and we're more than happy to get any of it. Let 
maybe trying to figure out how to type that in there. And then at any time, coaches, here's my contact info, my email, and my um, web address. Um, so if I can be of assistance, please reach out. Uh, I have a comment and a question real quick. Uh, first, Sam, I was just in your D class. Thank you for inviting me to this. Can uh, I don't know how I got in here, but did, did am I on a list where I'll get all of these invites? Because I would love to attend these. Uh, yeah, in fact, we post that every uh, every other week, so it's uh, bi-weekly. So the next one will be coming on November 6th. And then you can check with the – we'll send out invitations all the time. And it's also on the, the website. But we'd love to have you in. Perfect. And my second comment is to you, Coach Cottle. You were my JV coach in high school. Do you remember me? I'm Waylon <laughs> Calabrese. Hey, how are you doing, Waylon? I'm glad. How you're are here. you, man? Uh, yeah, so I just been... texted the whole – I just texted the whole team. I'm still friends with all those guys, and they all remember you too. They all said, "Hey." Oh, well, so I'll, I'll just, you just made my day. Thanks, Will. I'm glad you're here. Yeah, yeah man. Going to see you uh, coaching now. Yeah, I am. Yeah, and I just finished uh, Sam's uh, D course, and I've got. I think I got. I got to do six months time, right? And then I can. I can go for my C. Is that right? I think that's right. So Sounds yeah. Good. Yeah. Look yes, to sir. I'm, those. Yep. We're down in Austin, and I'll, I'll be here, man. Thank you, and thanks for the invite, Sam. Thanks, and then Maher's got his question that came in and said, would you like to, I would like your help in implementing these attacking principles. How can that be done? So Mark, I go about it. Uh, first of all, making the decision about the age group. So what's the age group? I know Adam's got a question too. Maher, can you type the age group that you're, you're coaching? It says the first time uh, to get them uh, 15 to 18 year olds. Okay. So that age group, yeah, I should be able to get all of the principles of attack across to those players. Uh, it's going to depend a little bit on what's their background in the, in the sport. What kind of coaching have they received? What level of play have they been at? Uh, so that age group, I'm just going to have a straightforward conversation with the players to start. Uh, of what did they understand about the principles of attack? I'm going to tell them, hey, first principle of attack is penetration. What does that mean to you guys uh, or gals? Uh, and have them explain it to me and then just kind of go through it that way. That's going to give me, well, that might take 15, 20, 30 minutes at the beginning of a single training session and having this conversation to get it all out, depending upon the kids. Uh, that's going to be time well invested. Because if I stand there and I ask those questions, I take some notes, I'm going to get a pretty clear idea as to what they at least mentally, cognitively understand about the principles of attack. From that, I can begin to decide which ones do I need to just reinforce and polish up on because they have a pretty good understanding of it already. Which ones are they, are they in doubt? And maybe which ones are they don't know at all. They've never heard of it. Uh, and then I can decide ones that are, they are know a little bit, but they're in doubt. It's kind of muddy for them. Um, that's the one I'm going to, ones I'm going to tackle first in a training session. But, you know, that age group, I could put together, I would think one of the first things I would put together would be maybe some 55, 77, 99 type uh, training activities where those principles are going to come out in those kind of head count numbers including a goalkeeper, so five and five, goalkeeper, four field players, you know, all of that. Uh, those principles are going to come out. And now I'm just going to guide them on those principles that we focused on. So we picked one or two for that training session that they're a little bit in doubt of, and I'm going to work on that. But honestly, Mark, I'm also going to look <laughs> at that moment as they play. Of those first couple of principles in that first bucket where I thought, you know, based on their answers, they understand these particular principles really well. I'm going to take a look at how do they actually execute it? How do they actually recognize it in a game? Because they can understand it cognitively, but actually executing it in a match, that's a whole different story. Uh, so I'm going to do that in training first, and then my ultimate test, of course, 
versus a match against an opposing team uh, where it's going to, we really find out, you know, how much they really not only understand, but can apply in a game situation, in a match. Uh, but if I go to, uh, like I said, some 5v5, 7v7, 99 exercises, uh, then I can begin to um, write out my guided questions, my keywords, and then I can dive in at the right moments in the game. And then it's just within the exercise. Then it's just finding the coachable moment like you would in any other training session, right? A natural stop is where you just pause it or throw in a corner kick, what have you, and you stop it and you ask a question or make a comment. A planned stoppage, you know, we're going to play a round of three minutes and then we're going to pause for a water break, whatever, uh, or get in the subs, you know, that kind of stuff. And that's where I'm going to ask a question or, or make a comment. I think it would be really important in that on the ones that they are a little bit in doubt of, but they've got the basic idea. They just need some more help with it. It would be really important then to recognize that my freeze moment, if I use a freeze, I think I would use a freeze only when they begin to do it correctly. I'm not going to do a freeze when they do it incorrectly because that'll just happen too often because they're still learning. And, and that will get them sidetracked. The tactical picture that I want them to see and keep in their brains is the correct moment, the correct play, the correct execution of that principle of attack, whichever one you're focused on. Uh, so that's what I'm going to yell freeze. I'm going to say and get to them, take a look at where you are, where's the ball, where are your teammates, where are we on the field? Where are the opposing players? This is where you are correctly executing the principle of mobility because of the run that Jane made okay, to get herself open on the far side. Okay? And how it ended up getting on the blind side of the opposing team. And that's the third attacker role. So I'm going to use the moments that they get it correct or real close to correct. That's where I'm going to use freeze everybody to to give them that correct image in their brains. Uh, and then we rehearse from there. Um, so hopefully, Mark, that gets you off to a good start. Warren, uh, what's another one, please, sir? Uh, one thing I'll add, too, because they keep getting asked about the invites. Once again, it's all on the, the YouTube channel that we've got posted on the website, but you can always get an invite anytime you want. Just check in with our North Texas website under coaching education, and the link will always be posted. Um, Adam out of Oklahoma again said, you recommend teaching players and teams both attacking and defending principles at the same time or one at a time? Uh, Adam, <laughs> as Adam very well knows, <laughs> it's the proverbial coaching answer, right? It depends. Um, you know, when I work with the ODP kids and we have two coaches, you know, one of us does the attack, one of us does the defense, and we are able to maximize our small amount of time that we have with ODP players, but those are kids who are already quite good players and have come from good soccer environments, et cetera. Um, if it's, uh, you know, um, a team that, you know, from my assessment of them, uh, that there's still a lot for them to learn about the principles, um, I'm going to just stay on one. I'm not going to try to coach the other side of the, of the coin. Um, I think the message will get lost perhaps with some of the players. If I'm, let's say, you know, I'm going from mobility, which is the third attacker to unbalance the opposing team. And at the same time, I'm working with the defense on balance. That makes a lot of sense, but do some of the messages get crisscrossed in the kids' minds? So for me, it comes back to, it depends. How much can a particular group of players absorb? Can they keep it clear? Uh, if I'm in doubt of that, I'm going to go, I'm just doing principles of tack day and whatever happens on the defense is what happens. Sorry, that was a very uh, on the fence answer. It depends. <laughs> yeah. No, and a good one. But do we have any other questions coming up? It looks like we've hit them all here. Are y'all uh, having another uh, C license coming up soon? Uh, yeah, once again, we've got one coming up in the spring. Uh, if you'll go on the website, in fact, I'm about to blast out a whole bunch of stuff here in a minute, but we'll have a, both a C and then coming up in July, we'll actually host our first B. 
So yeah, absolutely. If you look on the website, it's got all that information in there and how to get to it and the links and whatnot, but we'd love to have you in the spring. I, I looked, but there is, um, there's no C course yet. Uh, it should be in February. And once it's again, if you'll email me, I'll send you the link and you can do okay. it at Warren at NorthTexasSoccer.org. Um, and this is the first time I get this invitation from you guys, even though I like, I've done some, uh, courses with you already. So oh, yeah, yeah. But, um, I mean, the last course I couldn't do it with you. I had to do it with North Texas, which is, I don't want to go there so far. Oh, well, I hope you go to North Texas. <laughs> so, huh? That is Mark. Mark, re remember at this moment you're talking to the type of the soccer. <laughs> no, I don't want to go there because it's cost me money. It cost me hotels and cost me five hours to four hours Fair. drive to Dallas from Houston, you know? Fair enough. Yeah. So that answers your question. So I would check on the South Texas website then and I'll bet they'll have something pretty soon. I know they've got a fantastic uh, technical director. She's getting on top of it. And yeah, it'll probably be there some soon. Yes. So I would check with that and, and go there. Like I said, we'd love to have you in Dallas, even though it costs you money, but We'd love to have you up here. Yes, we will we'll come if we have to. Sounds good. Thank you, Thank you gentlemen. It was very nice. Thank yes, you. sir. Thank you. Have a good day. All right. Do we get any other questions? I didn't see any other questions, just a few no. other questions. Uh, just the one that we just discussed about uh, everybody. This is a uh, uh, the webinar series. This webinar series is... is uh, delivered by Warren at North Texas Soccer. So go to their website because you've got on the call here people from other parts of Texas and other states as well. Uh, so everybody go to the North Texas website and you can find uh, the webinars and recordings of the past webinars. There's some really good ones. Yep, and I'll go ahead and put that uh, in the chat, the website. And just the website, just go to coaching education and it'll have everything listed there as well as all the information. If you want to reach out to me at any time, you're more than welcome to do so. I'll, I'll get back to you as soon as we can, but happy to answer any of your questions. I, I think, you know, just like Sam, it's, we're here to help you out. And, and that's kind of the, the gist of what we're trying to do is trying to improve coaching throughout the, not only the area, but the region. And we'll go from there, but really Sam, thank you for taking the time to do this. This was incredibly beneficial. I enjoyed the, the, the session and I know everybody else did too and they did a fantastic job as always sir thank you for doing this for us thank you Warren I appreciate it thank everyone for joining in with us yeah well, with that being said we'll look forward to seeing everybody back on November 6th uh, with our next session and we'll have it all advertised out and like I said it gives it continues to grow thank you coaches thank you thank you, thank you very much